Hello and welcome to Look Down There, the show where we talk about all the things we don't talk about. I'm your host, Michelle Lamore. Today, my guest is a science communicator and sex education and fertility campaigner whose career and interests span the worlds of science and taboo. She's the author of Story of V, which came out in 2003, and now, almost 20 years later, has a new edition called Raising the Skirt, The Unsung Power of the Vagina. It is an honor and a treat to have her with me today. Please welcome Dr. Catherine Blackledge. Oh, lovely to be here, Michelle. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining me. Um, your book is incredible. There is, there's so much information. It is so dense and rich with um, knowledge and facts and figures and history. It was just like, I need to take a break sometimes just to uh-huh. absorb it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like to consider myself well versed in the vagina and the vulva, and but you take it to a whole new level. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I always wanted it to be a treasure trove of everything vaginal um, because when I when I got the idea for the book and I went to see what I'd been written before, so it was in 1999 when I got the idea for the book, I went to have a look what had been written and there was absolutely nothing out there. The only book I could find was The Diseases of the Vagina and Vulva. And that said it all, really. Um, there was just negative stuff about the vagina, nothing positive. Um, uh, but as soon as I started looking, it just blossomed. It was, you know, there was so much to discover. So, yeah, I was like, I'm going to create this treasure trove. Um, yeah, that's what I did. Um, what drew you to look for that information in the first place? What was that call? I mean, obviously mm. you saw there was sort of a, a desert of information mm. about uh, all things vagina. Um, but what drew you to that in the first place? Uh, a, a couple of things. Um, one, I, w- I was working as a science journalist. Um, and at that time, I've been covering it. There was the release of Viagra. So it was all about male sexuality, nothing for women. Um, and also some news had come out from Australia. Um, Helen O'Connell in Australia um, had discovered that the clitoris was... Um, far larger than anybody had previously thought. And I remember thinking, oh, that's, that's really strange. What, it's 1999 and we're only just discovering this. Um, so those are kind of like my um, uh, science triggers, if you will. Uh, but th- there was another trigger for me, and I didn't discuss this when the book first came out um, 20 years ago. And I didn't discuss it because, in a way, it hadn't even come into my consciousness, but but it was... It, it was the fact that I am infertile. Um, I contracted chlamydia sometime between losing my virginity when I was 17 and then discovering it at, at just before my 21st birthday that I had chlamydia. Um, and, and I literally was told days before my 21st birthday that you're infertile, you won't be able to have children without, at least not without medical help. And I mean, that was crushing, absolutely crushing and I I didn't receive any help for that news and I just you know stuffed it away down to some dark part of myself and I didn't uh, so when the book first came out I, I didn't mention that as part of the reason why I'd written the book and it's only years later that I realised ah oh, perhaps that had something to do with wanting to write a book about the vagina because I myself felt like I wasn't you know I didn't work properly as a woman um I I couldn't have children naturally um I'm I'm very lucky that IVF finally worked for me and I I am a mum now but I had many many years of of, um facing the utter heartache of infertility and really feeling not properly like a woman and feeling very negative about my genitals you know they they don't work properly and and i think in all of that as well was this realization that if i'd been a stronger person in my teenage years um felt prouder to be a woman um felt more sexually confident i would have probably said to the guy who gave me chlamydia no put a condom on it um but i didn't because i wasn't I didn't feel strong in myself. I didn't feel powerful as a woman. Um, 
Uh, so, yeah, it, it came from two strange places. One, the, the painful side, and, and one, the, the absolute uh, knowledge that there must be more to the vagina. Um, uh, and there absolutely is. Uh, there's far, far more. Um, lots of stories that have been suppressed, uh, lots of stories that people have just ignored or overlooked. Uh, I mean, the, the story about the clitoris being so much bigger than previously thought. That, that, that was known so many years ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, but we've just conveniently overlooked that information. And I, I know when I was growing up, I I wasn't even told I had a clitoris. Uh, I think I must have, I was trying to think about when I first heard the word, and I think I must have read it in a book. Um, and I don't know my um, idea of what my clitoris was, was just some sort of button. Uh, you know, I, I had no sense of, the, the beautiful wishbone shape um and you know when, when i I've discovered all of these things it was like ah this is something that every girl and woman should know um and i, I said i'm lucky to be a mother now and my daughter knew she had a clitoris from the you know same time that she knew she had a hand or an arm or an all other parts of her body because it's it's part of who we are and 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 if we don't know that we have all these wonderful parts of ourselves, um, then you lose your power. And and also, if people don't talk about these things, then you get shame attached to that. Um, so we live in a, a powerless, um, shameful way, which is, uh, unfortunately, I think is the case for, for most girls and women. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you touched on so many things right there, but reading about the clitoris you know that it's actually bigger than it was and that was discovered in 1998 that was one of the things that really shocked me um mm -hmm. and and then i started thinking like you you know did i i was thinking about my health books growing up and the diagrams mm -hmm. I'm like was that even on there i don't even yeah. know and then i was thinking well when did i first hear about it and i i, I think i remember feeling enlightened when I heard the word clitoris like mm -hmm. oh, that's that's you know that's what it is but that must have been in my mid to late 20s yeah you know, yeah I feel that just recently within the past few years really you know seeing all the information that we have available to us that the clitoris is so much bigger than we mm -hmm. thought it was and there's so much power in that and connecting to those parts of your body and it's yeah pleasure connecting to that pleasure yeah yeah and 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 you know the sad thing is is that um uh, now my daughters of an age will talk about sex education and we've looked at the the books that are out there for um, uh, children and they still talk about the clitoris as a small button um and it's like ah why are we still giving um you know the next generation inaccurate information and and how can girls ever grow up to be in their full sexual power if they don't have that information um you know we don't talk um about uh, you know the, the the sexual feelings that the clitoris gives you. We don't talk about the clitoris um, becoming erect like the penis does. You know, boys know they get. Uh, you know, in the sex education classes, yes, you get an erection, the blood rushes into it. But I, I don't know which sex education class tells the girls that they get erections because the blood rushes into the clitoris in the same way and they feel that sensation, you know, like the, the you know, beeping of the, of the clitoris. It, you know, it's just not talked about and, and it should be because otherwise, oh, yeah, we lose our power and our, um, and our connection to our sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we remain a mystery to ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I wrote my book to uh, put out there all the beautiful ways that girls and women have power um, because of having a vagina. Um, and, uh, and and I noticed when you were talking about uh, beforehand what we were going to talk about, um, vagina is obviously a word that, um, well, there's, uh, some people have said there are problems with using the word vagina because it just means, you know, 
clinically speaking, the, the internal muscular tube. Um, and some people say you should use the word vulva, but the vulva is just the outside of the vagina. And and I actually think it's it's incredible that in English, despite the fact that we have over a million words in the English language, we don't have one word that we are just comfortable using that means all of the vagina obviously in eastern languages they have yoni which does mean all of it but but here um, i mean vagina has come to be the catch-all term but lots of people do you know do say no that's that's clinically incorrect um what about the vulva uh, which is why when i was doing the research for my book i was fascinated to discover that there, there wasn't an, an, an old word for female genitalia, um, ideon is the Greek version, and the Latin version is verenda, and it means the parts that inspire awe and respect and reverence. And, and when I read that, it was like, wow, this this is the word that we should be teaching our, our, our daughters, our, our nieces, our, our granddaughters. You know, this is a word that tells them just how uh, amazing their bodies are. Um, and uh, you know, sadly, verendas fallen out of use. Um, but but at the moment, I, I'm, I'm I'm campaigning to bring it back. Uh, I have a petition at um, change.org, uh, say veranda uh, to to bring it back. Because I think we need those words. Because if we don't have a word we're comfortable using, you know, um, uh, shame can build um, around um, who we are. Um, you know, women choose not to go to the doctor because they feel uncomfortable. Um, leading to unwanted pregnancies, infertility, sexual mm. uh, diseases, etc. So, you know, we really, we need that word um, if, we, if we need, to, if we want to have change. Uh-huh. <laughs> Great. Verenda. Right? I Verenda, it. It yeah. It says everything, the awe and respect and reverence and I definitely resonate with that word and the power that it holds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, too many people, um, there's a survey done fairly recently that showed that, uh, that one in five people, parents don't use any word at all when they refer to um, girls' genitals. And you just think how that must feel for those girls you know, to have something so terrible between their legs that it cannot be named. Um, you know, right? so it, yeah, I'm passionate about yeah, that yeah. has to change. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Is the, is the name an issue, but also looking at it is, is an issue, which is... You know, Absolutely. My whole yeah. family is look down there and it's removing yeah. that pain. The more that we can get in touch with our parts. I mean, it's it would be like... You know, if you could never look at your big toe or something, yeah. <laughs> you know, but like your big toe isn't responsible for creation of life and pleasure. Mm -hmm. and stuff. So, you know, we don't look at it. We don't say the name. So no wonder why we are so disconnected from our own power. But yeah. the more that we can speak those words or look directly at it, look at the power, the more yeah. we can then connect to our own power. Yeah, I, I, another thing that, that I uh, um, wanted for the book was to include photographs of, um, well, there are vulvas because they are just the outside of, of the vagina, um, because we don't know as women what other women look like. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, we just have images from porn and sadly they're, they're not natural depictions of women. Um, so I, I think it's really important for women to see what other women look like, to know, um, you know, what your style is, um, how we all differ so wonderfully. Um, yeah, to, to really take pleasure in what we have. Yeah. 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 Speaking of yeah. Photos, yeah. So I, I, you know, I'm in the States. So yes. all of my photos are black and white. And oh, you, yeah. In the book, you mentioned in the book that you couldn't print the color photos in the mm. world. Is that right? Um, when when my book originally came out in the UK, there are color photos in the middle. It's a, 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 a central color spread of vaginas. Um, but when... Um, 
uh, an edition came out in the US and also in Japan, um, I was told that there would have to be black and white pictures in the book. Um, there wasn't any legality issue in the US. It was more a morality issue. It was seen as um, just too much to put colour images in there. Um, but it was a legality issue in Japan where it's actually illegal to depict colour images of genitalia. Um, but, but having said that, when um, when you write a book and, and it comes out in different editions, you get sent a copy of those editions and, and, and you don't have it for other countries. You don't have any say about what they're going to put on the front cover. So after knowing that in Japan, my, um, uh, I was going to just have black and white pictures of, of the vagina in there. Imagine by surprise when the, the Japanese edition of my book arrived and on the front cover is a massive pixelated colour vagina. <laughs> And I mean, it's incredible. It's pixelated, so it's legal. But if you hold it at arm's length, it's very, very obviously um, a wonderful colour vulva. Um, so I don't quite know how they, they got around that in Japan, but the book's been incredibly successful in Japan. I don't know whether that's that's part of the reason. don't know. Well, your book is called Raising the Skirt. So let's <laughs> talk about that tradition of raising the skirt and and all the different ways that that was used in, in cultures. Mm. So raising the skirt, the gesture of raising the skirt, I think is one of my favorite things that I discovered when researching the book. Um, it is a power gesture. It's a female power gesture, and it's possibly the oldest female power gesture. Um, and it is lifting up the skirt to reveal your yoni, um, and you're doing that deliberately to cause an effect in the world. Um, and that effect can be um, from mythology. You hear that um, it can cause the world uh, to come back into harmony. It can bring light back to the world. It can bring fertility back to the world. Um, you hear from history and folklore, a woman raising her skirt if a bear appears out of the woods will cause the bear to disappear or um, a village is being attacked by the devil and the act of raising the skirt will uh, cause the devil to, to run away in fright. Um, and there, there are so many beautiful stories across millennia about the raising the skirt gesture. Um, it, it, and it can be about scaring um, a threat away, but it can also be about uh, improving fertility. So women um, would go out to their fields in India and in Europe, and they'd raise their skirt and they'd say to their crops, please grow as high as my skirt is now. Um, you have in Finland, um, the lady of the house would straddle a gate and the um, the cattle would go underneath the gate and her exposed vagina would confer fertility on the cattle. Um, and, and these stories, uh, the, you know, they're found everywhere in Greek mythology, um, Irish mythology, uh, Japanese mythology. Um, they're mm -hmm. so widespread, and it's and it's not just um, a woman doing it by herself. There are acts of women doing this collectively, um, and the gesture has a name. It's called Anna Sama or Anna Suramai, and you can, can literally have armies, anasoma armies of women raising their skirts um, to reveal the vaginas. And and um, in China, uh, women would stand on the battlements and would do that to face off the, the armies. Um, you have, uh, it's not just an ancient gesture, it's the knowledge that has carried through the years. So you have in Africa um, in the 1960s, this was actually used by thousands of women to protest against the changes that were being brought in against the way they farmed the land. And the women um, managed to keep their rights when after they'd done this wonderful uh, collective gesture of Anasoma. Um, so it's it's just the most amazing gesture, and you find it in artwork as well. So artwork going back to 1400 BCE of um, women raising their skirts, uh, and and I think it's something that we should all know about. You know, this is a real potent female. It's a proud gesture, and um, since my book came out, um, I'm very proud that people have started taking this gesture up and using it again. So in 2017 in Poland, there were demonstrations, um, there were demonstrations about um, um, 
uh, about um, the, the government was um, trying to outlaw abortion um, and, and so they used uh, Anna Serma uh, to protest against that and in Italy um, uh, uh, male violence against women and they used Anna Serma um, and just recently uh, the protests in Portland um, Black Lives Matter protests uh, a woman who became known as Naked Athena she went out there completely naked in front in front of the police the guns and displayed herself so proud in her body and I, I just think it's such a beautiful gesture um you know it's protective but it's also saying stop remember where you come from you know respect uh yeah so i i, I love uh, the gesture of anna Serma. um and yeah i think it's one we should all know about and and the very peculiar thing is is that after i finished the first draft of my book i'd gone to my local charity shop i had no money at the time. I was looking for something new in the charity shop. And the, the owner of the charity shop said, you'll never guess what happened minutes before you came in. But there'd been an elderly woman there and they thought that she'd been um, taking something from the shop and in prote protesting that she hadn't, she raised her skirt to show her vagina. <laughs> Oh, when this woman told me that, it's like, oh my goodness, I've just finished a book writing about this. It's like goosebumps all over me. It's like this gesture is still exists. It's still there. Women know it. It's our power gesture. Yeah. You know, we can encourage fertility and crops and, and encourage good weather, but it also had this impact of warding off evil. And yes. I was thinking you know, well, is it warding off evil because the vagina is so scary to look at? And then I thought, no, it's warding off evil because you're looking at your or origin and where you come from. Yes. And yeah. it's kind of like, you know, no matter how successful you get, no matter how much money you get, if you are behaving badly or without integrity and, and mm -hmm. your mom comes in, like you can't, you can't do that. You know, the, the mom kind of brings you back down yeah. to yeah. reality. And so maybe that's kind of the energy that's happening right there. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is that remember where you come from and women, we are the power source. We're the origin. Yeah. So it's deeply potent gesture. Yeah. 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 Well, Catherine, oh, there was a part of this book that I literally yelped. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but it was oh, the, yeah. the hyena section. Okay. So you yeah. talk at great length about the history of the skirt raising and, and then we move into the animal kingdom and, and yeah. really you're showing all the different kinds of variety that is within the animal kingdom and that we are mm -hmm. also no different. There's so much yes. within us, but um, in highlighting this, you talk about the hyena. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. let you tell it. <laughs> you tell the story. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. I feel like shook about it. <laughs> <laughs> the female spotted hyena. I love the female spotted hyena. Um, for centuries, there have been so many uh, myths about hyenas. Um, you know, myths that they can shape shift, um, myths that they can change sex. They've been deemed as unclean animals, that they desecrate graves, that with a cackling laugh, they lure shepherds to their death. Um, just so many um, uh, negative things said about hyenas, you know, they're much maligned. And, and the reason for that is, I believe, it's because they transgress the natural order of the world. Um, and that's because in um, the spotted hyena world, it's the females that are bigger, it's the females that are more brutal, it's the fact that all females are dominant to all males, even the, the youngest, uh, oldest male uh, are subservient to the uh, smallest female hyena. Um, and the other big uh, shock for spotted hyenas is that the females have this incredible clitoris, fully erectile, just extends away from her body. And if you look at a male hyena with their penis next to the, the female with their clitoris, you, you literally cannot tell them apart. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's it's that's why they, the idea that, you know, they could 
um, change sex because it's so hard to sex a hyena because of this incredible clitoris um, and, and also the fact that females are bigger and more dominant um, but unfortunately for the poor female spotted hyena yes it might be great to have a big clitoris but um, she also her urethra runs through it just like in a penis so she urinates through her clitoris but that's not all she actually has to give birth through her clitoris and it's a narrow passageway so it's an absolutely excruciating birth and it's not just painful for her it's also terrible for the pup and, and actually um for first time hyena mothers usually their first pup is stillborn because it's so hard for it to to come through the clitoris literally um so <sighs> You know, nature designs some crazy designs. And the clitoris was definitely not designed for easy childbirth. Um, but after a, a female spotted hyena has given birth for the first time, you can eat more, far more easily sex them because there is a literal streak of scar running down her clitoris, um, and you don't see that on the men. So, so yes, you can you can sex them then more easily. But the the poor female hyena. Um, she she goes through a lot and, and her pups too for uh, for her wonderful clitoris but th there are other species that do have incredible clitoris like that the um, female spider monkeys do and they use theirs to spray their urine around and it's kind of like you know the the advertising when they're ready to have sex um so you know they they use it to the, in a positive way yeah the clitoris yeah. and I jumped out and I turned to my husband and was like, look at this. And you know, of course my the, the pictures in my book are black and white and so I'm studying yeah. very hard and is that really a clitoris? Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. One of the other most surprising things in that section was you saying that the females actually do give consent to the the act of procreation that that mm. you know, I didn't realize that because I, I thought it was just like the males were like okay it's happening but the the vagina can actually close it can pull up into yeah. the body they you know you said they can simply walk away um, yeah so I didn't know that that was uh, yes yeah yeah. Yeah, I, and I think that's something else that, you know, in uh, natural history programs, they too often just tell the same old story of male going out there searching for sex, taking any female. Uh, it's an easy story, it's an old story, and it's repeated too often, and it's incorrect. Um, female genitalia are incredibly intricate, they're incredibly muscular. I mean, they are just a, an amazing um, piece of um, engineering, um, muscular engineering. And, and you can see when people, well, for years, people didn't pay any interest at all to the vagina. When I first started looking at, um, you know, research into penises, research into vaginas, was hardly anything about vaginas, so much about size and shape of penises. But, uh, but um, uh, in, in the last few decades, more has been done. And, and they've shown, yeah, to to actually persuade a female to have sex, um, the, 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 so the male rabbit, he has to stimulate her externally before he can um, um, uh, get to where he needs to go um, for fertilization to occur. And in insects, it can be incredibly um, intricate. They have to go through any number of different maneuvers um, focusing on the female's sexual pleasure, focusing on what her anatomy needs um, in order to have a hope of fertilization occurring. And even after that, she's got the, the muscular strength to be able to move sperm at her will inside her body and, you know, use one male sperm over another's. Uh, so, yeah, that was something I had not a clue about before I started researching the book, and it really opened my eyes to um, just how powerful females are, but how active we are, and, you know, the, the whole myth about females, passive males active, it's just... It's just an old, sad story. Um, we're incredibly active and powerful. Um, and, and again, I, I would love that to be taught, um, at schools so that females feel that sense of power in their body you know the the, the story of how um sperm and egg meet that's that's another one of those stories where it's you know we're sold this idea of the um 
little sperm battling all the other sperms, you know, swimming valiantly towards the egg, and then the one victor penetrating the egg. When actually that story is just so untrue, and and you know the egg's ten thousand times bigger than the sperm. Um, it's the female's body that actively moves the sperm within her body. Without the female moving the sperm, it wouldn't get anywhere. They have very little swimming motion actually. Um, and then it's one where they, this massive egg she engulfs the sperm um you know embraces and engulfs the sperm so it's a vastly different story but you know we should be changing the stories that we tell um our children uh because that's a way to to give girls power um, and it's their power and we've been denying it um, for so many years denying them their power now I want to go and talk about pleasure. So at the end of the book, mm. we discuss pleasure. And I wanted to check in with you to see, kind of gauge how we're doing as a society, as a culture. Um, because you said in 1948, Margaret Mead wrote mm. that in order for a female to find sexual fulfillment, the three things need to happen. So one is to live in a culture that recognizes female desire as value. Two, her culture must allow her to understand the mechanics of her sexual anatomy. And three, her culture must teach the various skills that will allow her to reach orgasm. So how do you think we're doing <laughs> these days? Well, I don't think we've made much progress. We have made some progress. I don't want to be too negative. We have made some progress, but we're still not teaching females about their sexual anatomy. Um, I don't think we do still, I don't think we do really live in a culture that um, values female desire, not as much as we value male desire. Um, there's some work to be done there in leveling up. Um, and we certainly do not teach children about the mechanics of sexual pleasure. I don't know anybody that teaches masturbation, for, exa for example, to children. I think that's really frowned on by most people. Um, but I think we do have to talk about those things with children. Um, because if you're not taught, how can you ever learn that something's okay and something is all right? Um, I think we have to find a way to improve our education, definitely. Um, and I mean, what you are doing and what other people are doing, I think that helps massively in valuing female sexual desire, um, absolutely massively. I, I can see a real big shift from 20 years ago when my book first came out. I mean, when it, when it first came out, I was I wanted to call it Vagina and I was told that I could not do that. Um, it was too much. In the publishing meeting where they gave me a deal, they um, they couldn't even say the word Vagina. Um, so I couldn't possibly have my book called Vagina. And I mean, but in the intervening 20 years, other people have brought out books called Vagina. And we, we do talk far more easily and readily. So, so things are changing. I think the big shift now has to come from, uh, you know, we still take away female power far too readily. Um, so it's it's about uh, redefining what power is, um, showing that females really do have so much power, um, and and um, helping girls and women to own their own power, their sexual power. Um, uh, because we are incredibly sexual beings. Um, there's uh, there's a story um, from uh, Greek mythology, um, and it's Hera and her husband Zeus are arguing about who has the greatest pleasure during sex, and they call in Tiresias, um, and they call uh, Tiresias in because he's lived as both a woman and a man. So they say to Tiresias, okay, who has the greatest pleasure during sex? Is it a woman or a man? And Tiresias says, um, thrice three goes to women, one only to men. <laughs> I love that. And I mean, and it's not just Greek mythology, it's other cultures all say females have and are capable of the greatest sexual power. Um, and and uh, 
I noticed when I was doing my research that, uh, you know, they, they, they've done laboratory studies looking at how many orgasms can women have, how many orgas orgasms can men have. And in a laboratory setting, one woman managed an, an, an eye-watering, wonderful 134 orgasms. Um, in the same time, a man managed just 16. And, uh, and when I looked at that, that's about that ratio nine to one. Um, so it's like, oh my goodness, maybe it is literally true. We do get to have nine times the uh, the amount of sexual pleasure. Um, I think we're capable of it, but uh, still our society is against us a lot of the time, hampers us, yeah. Uh, that's uh, an important uh, part about redefining power because mm -hmm. I think we have a really masculine idea of what power is and yes. what's exemplified to us is that it's power over, that we're, we're ruling over, we're manipulating with fear and scarcity when really it's about finding that power within that mm. is really strong and grounded and present. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think females have so much more power than they, they realise. Um, cultures told us that there's just one particular kind of power, a, a male power. Um, you know, suddenly we, we still, you know, just even going to see a film. And I, I, I recently I've, I've been watching lots of children's movies. And in those children's movies, you know, it's just male voices, male voices, male characters. It's like, ah, oh, no, how can you even begin to hope that you've, can get power in the world if all you see reflected back at you is, you know, uh, maleness. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we have to change so many things so that girls and women see that they have um, the opportunity to wield their power. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to be fighting the good thing. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's one uh, well worth fighting. Yes. Uh, please tell everyone where they can find your book or follow you on social media, wherever you want to connect. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, um, Raising the Skirt, it's available at all the bookstores on Amazon. Um, you can uh, find me at my website, catherineblackledge.com, on Twitter at Cass Blackledge, um, on Instagram at Catherine Blackledge. Um, uh, yeah, lots of different ways you can find me. And please get in contact. And I also, um, I'm collecting Raising the Skirt stories. Um, so many people contact me with, you know, a, a different story from a different culture of, of how Raising the Skirt um, can uh, protect uh, land, people, family, or um, promote fertility. So if anybody knows Raising the Skirt stories, please let me know. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, it is well, an honor to have you with me today, and I'm so pleased that you were able to join me. And everyone, please go out and buy the book. I will put a link up on, on all the, the pages here. And now it's time for you to spread your legs and spread the love. Like us and follow and subscribe. Tell your friends. Raise your skirts. Follow us here at I Look Down There or me at Michelle Lamore. And remember that confidence comes from the bottom up. So grab a mirror and look down there. And long live the veranda. <laughs>